everyone. This is, my name is Chad Nyman. I work in forest products with the University of Kentucky Forestry Extension. I have with me today Mr. Kenton Senna. Dr. Kenton Senna works as a lecturer in the Lewis Honors College. And we have Dr. Thomas Ochodo within the Forestry and Natural Resources Department here in the College of Agriculture. Uh, we are going to be talking today about a recent research project uh, that a team of researchers here at the university underwent. And we're going to go ahead and break away to the PowerPoint for that. So wood bioenergy for rural energy resilience. And so this is identifying sites with high potential for successful bioenergy program implementation. We have Dr. Ochodo, Dr. Contreras, myself, Chad Nyman, Dr. Senna, Dr. Yang, Mr. Dan Eaton, D. Raj Betha, and Jordan George. So looking at the project, this project was initiated to connect those dots between the residual wood, wood industry waste from industry. That's including sawdust, chips, and bark. It also connects the dots with energy resilience, which is reliable, uninterrupted power supply, and the critical infrastructure that we have around the state. So those are facilities that they especially require uninterrupted power. And so can wood waste bioenergy infrastructure lead to improved energy resilience in rural Kentucky? Those are the, the main focuses of this project. And so what is energy resilience? And so energy, rebellion, energy resilience has to do with the capacity of the energy grid to be able to maintain supply in the midst of disastrous circumstances. It could be natural disasters, and shifting energy production from fossil fuels to decentralized renewable energy can also improve resilience. And so that includes bioenergy from wood waste and so we know that we're trying to have energy that continuously goes on through any kind of disastrous circumstance, something that is renewable and resilient. And also there's this component of the rural communities and those being more vulnerable than urban and suburban communities to non-resilient energy infrastructure. And so wood bioenergy looking at these opportunities for rural Kentucky, Kentucky's forest industry is thriving in Kentucky. So we have an estimated 13 and a half billion in total economic impacts in 2018. Sawmills report over 2 million cubic feet of residuals, that's bark, chips, and sawdust that were unused in 2015. And so many rural communities in Kentucky and within that Appalachian region are economically vulnerable and they would benefit from having diversified economies. The development of a wood waste bioenergy industry in rural Kentucky, it could provide another market opportunity for all those unused residuals. And so that reduces sawmill costs in having to take that material to a landfill or some other location. And it also provides jobs in the region at the same time. Going along with the context of this project, the potential economic benefits, looking at a few other studies in the US, one Mississippi study developed the development of a wood bioenergy industry was expected to create 585 direct jobs and 37.3 million in total value added. In East Texas, a wood-based electricity production was expected to create about 1,320 jobs and about 352 million in total output. And then in the Northwest, forest-based bioenergy was expected to create 152 million annually and create about 2,382 jobs. So the general theme from all of these is that there are areas that have these wood baskets and there could be potential economic benefits from using these low-grade residuals for energy production and job creation as well. Looking at the ecological benefits, 
Kentucky's forests are impacted by a number of stressors. We have lots of invasive pests, pathogens, plants. We have poor management practices being implemented um, by landowners who own that property, as well as those who are harvesting and, and conducting activities like that on the industrial side as well. You have consistent harvesting of only high value timber over time and that leads to reduced forest health and the value of those forests for the private owned or for the private landowners that own those forests. So you want to retain that health and value. So one example, specifically white oak, is a very valuable hardwood species uh, from a timber perspective, and it is very much under current conservation concern. The management for conservation is expensive. Some studies have suggested that the costs of timber stand improvement activities can be subsidized by markets for low value unmarketable timber. In addition, increases in bioenergy production are expected to provide carbon emissions re uh, reducing benefits as well. So getting into the research questions. Are there critical infrastructure sites in Eastern Kentucky, which would be suitable sites based on the distance from the sawmills producing the wood waste for establishing a wood fired combined heat and power or CHP unit? If the bioenergy industry were developed in Eastern Kentucky, how would it impact the region's economy? Rationale, critical infrastructure an example, hospitals, emergency services, are especially needed, needful of consistent, reliable, uninterrupted power supply. The transportation, one of the main constraints on feasibility of bioenergy systems, is that cost of transportation of biomass. Thus, we focused our analysis to identify critical infrastructure sites close to sawmills. So following the research approach, looking into the spatial analysis, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kenton Senna to take us through the spatial analysis. Thanks, Chad. So um, <clears throat> for this, one major component of this project, um, as Chad has already alluded to or discussed, um, is this kind of idea that if we, can, if we can identify kind of the sweet spots where um, we might have kind of in a region an excess um, kind of production of wood residuals, um, kind of that are that are close enough to or in close enough proximity to um, critical infrastructure. Those critical infrastructure sites might serve as um, feasible uh, locations for an establishment of a, of a combined heat and power unit um, that's fueled by wood waste. Um, and again, this is this whole part of the analysis is just to. Um, identify the spots that are close enough to sawmills where transportation of wood residuals from sawmills um, would be cheaper, um, hopefully more um, feasible economically. Um, so for our uh, analysis, we um, restrict, restricted our uh, study region to just the Appalachian counties of Kentucky, so um, eastern Kentucky. Um, we wanted to do this for a few reasons, um, one of which is uh, that our project goal um, dealt specifically with rural energy resilience. So we really wanted to kind of focus on a rural area of Kentucky, mostly rural area. Um, and we also wanted to focus our research on uh, an area where the forest industry was um, thriving and, and strong. And we know that the, this, is, this is true in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and so, uh, we uh, kind of the first step of the spatial analysis of this project was to develop a geospatial database that included um, data about sawmills in the region, in our study region. Um, and so we uh, included not only the locations of sawmills, but also all the information that we had about how much residuals um, was produced by each of those sawmills. Um, and then in addition to that, we had a, we built a database um, that included information about critical infrastructure. Um, for our purposes, um, we kind of started thinking about critical infrastructure as hospitals and emergency services. Um, and emergency services would be like police and fire. Um, and 
as we proceeded through the project, we decided to focus our analysis on hospitals um, because it quickly became clear that hospitals um, would maybe serve uh, our purposes best because of their high power demand. Um, and so, whereas some of the, the smaller kind of emergency services units um, or facilities wouldn't use enough power to make it um, make sense to install a, a CHP unit there to supplement their power consumption. So we focused on hospitals and we estimated kind of annual an energy consumption of hospitals based on hospital size um, data that we're able to access um, through the uh, available um, geospatial data sets. Um, and then we uh, did a, a simple transportation cost estimation. Um, and this basically used Google Maps um, distance calculator to estimate the travel time um, from the nearest sawmills to the, the, uh, each hospital. Um, and then we estimated the travel or transportation cost um, based on this, this estimation of about $80 an hour um, to trans transport that, the materials from um, the sawmill to the hospital. So um, kind of our next, next phase in this was, you know, again, the, the point of this was to identify the hospitals that are close enough to um, an, enough um, sawmills that are producing enough residual or enough wood waste um, that it could actually support um, running a CHP unit um, to, to produce a reasonable amount of energy. So we kind of modeled this under two different scenarios. One of them was a 100 kilowatt um, CHP unit and the other one was a two megawatt CHP unit um, and we basically decided or on a threshold of um, running this unit for five out of seven days um, and, and the thought was that if if um, a given hospital wouldn't use a CHP unit for more than uh, sorry for for at least five out of seven days um, then it wouldn't really make sense to go through the, the trouble of installing um, so facilities that didn't have power requirements um, that, that would support that kind of usage, um, we uh, dropped out of our analysis. So we estimated the amount of biomass that would be required to run the CHP for this amount of time, um, and then estimated the cost of transporting that amount of biomass from the nearest sawmills, um, and then estimated the cost of purchasing that same amount of energy. So if we um, all the energy that we could produce from that amount of biomass, um, what would be the cost of purchasing that energy from the grid, um, and, we, and we judged that on kind of average Kentucky utility rates, and then um, basically decided that if the cost of purchasing the energy from the grid um, was less than the cost of transporting biomass feedstock from nearby sawmills, that it wouldn't make economic sense to establish the CHP unit there. So this analysis basically prioritized hospitals that were close enough to sawmills that produced a sufficient amount of residuals um, that it would render it potentially economically feasible to, be, to transport that material from the sawmill to the hospital. Um, and in, in theory, this would um, basically mean that each of these um, candidate hospital sites um, that were identified by this analysis um, were close enough to sufficient residual, um, sufficient amounts of residuals that we could, we could uh, economically run a CHP unit on that site, just from wood waste in the in the area. <clears throat> um, so then, kind of broadening out, um, Chad mentioned earlier um, this idea of um, low quality or unmarketable. Um, timber in our forests and how um, high grading and, and other kinds of management practices over time uh, can lead to forest stand devaluation. So another question that we were interested in is um, whether um, a, establishing a CHP unit that's wood fired at a particular site might subsidize or um, alleviate some of the costs of um, doing forest management that might include removing or culling um, undesired species or unhealthy or 
um, low quality species from a, a forest stand. And so the thought here is, um, <clears throat> right now there might not be anything you can do with that material, but if we established uh, wood bioenergy um, infrastructure, um, there might be kind of a market where you could harvest that material um, and be able to, to get rid of it in, a, in an economically um, kind of feasible manner. So this, this phase of the analysis was kind of like a, a supplementary or a backup um, supply of biomass feedstock um, beyond the wood waste um, feedstock from saw, that's being produced by sawmills. Um, and so to do this, um, our analyst Dan um, Eaton quantified, uh, attempted to uh, quantify standing unmarketable timber using Forest Service forest inventory analysis data for the study region. Um, and so we kind of decided on some criteria that would meet um, what we would consider standing unmarketable timber. Um, and so we decided that trees less than 12 and a half inches DBH um, and any trees that were marked as rough call or rotten call um, would be considered unmarketable for our analysis. And I do want to mention um, and point out that certainly not all of the trees that are less than 12 and a half inches um, in diameter um, are not actually unmarketable. Um, but we do know that the understory and midstory of a lot of our forests in eastern Kentucky um, can be dominated by species that aren't marketable or aren't desirable um, by the forest industry. And so um, we know that this analysis is capturing a, lo a lot of that material. Okay. On to Dr. Shido, who's going to talk about the um, economic analysis. Oh, okay. So thank you, uh, Brenton. <laughs> so the next aspect of uh, this project was to conduct um, potential economic impacts. Um, as we are aware, economic impact is one of the criteria that is uh, usually relied upon to help us make decisions in terms of investments uh, in various um, projects. So there are a number of tools out there that are available that can be used to estimate economic potential economic impacts of this kind of projects. So among these um, uh, different tools that we have, um, computable general equilibrium is one of those models and uh, is most suitable for this kind of analysis for the simple reason that it um, takes care of everything that is happening in the economy. So just to illustrate that, um, I'll give you a, a small example um, involving uh, one key product uh, here in Kentucky, which is bourbon. So many people actually may not realize the relationship between the bourbon that we buy from the, 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 the liquor stores and uh, the, the, the white hawk. Um, so for us to produce uh, bourbon, we need um, barrels which are produced from white oak trees. That means if we have any problem of supply of white oak, then that would indirectly or directly affect uh, the production of bourbon and uh, obviously how much you pay for it. So this tool um, we call CG model uses uh, what we call social accounting matrix which is basically just um, a table of transactions of what is taking place in the economy, the interchange of different sectors of the economy, from labor, uh, capital, investments, taxes, and other intermediate uh, purchases that we buy to produce uh, other uh, commodities. So, the CG model has been used widely. Uh, there are many uh, studies that have employed this analytical tool. So for our project, this particular one, the social accounting matrix, which we abbreviate as SAM, uh, we purchased this from Implan. So Implan is um, basically a commercial enterprise that 
uh, collect data from various agencies, mostly Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a, an agency within the US Department of Commerce. So they collect uh, this economic data and uh, produce annual databases at the county levels and also at the state level. So we got the latest data that is available, uh, which is 2017 for the 35 uh, Eastern Kentucky counties that were the focus of this study. So within this um, social accounting matrix, we have over 500 um, sectors of the economy, which basically produce specific um, commodities that we buy. So we aggregated this into 11, which were most relevant for this analysis. And um, these included agriculture, logging, uh, bioenergy, electricity production, and uh, other electricity produced from other sources like from coal, and um, electric power distribution and transmission. We had natural gas distribution, coal mining, wood products manufacturing, transportation uh, services, and the rest of the economy. So the rest of the economy here basically is all the other sectors uh, lumped together. So how we did this um, was basically following some uh, well-established uh, standards that have been used in the past. However, modeling bioenergy was challenging, particularly uh, with the current database that we are using. So there wasn't actually uh, a bioenergy sector per se in the social accounting matrix database that we were using. So we had to um, um, kind of uh, estimate a new dimensions within the existing um, sectors in the database so as to come up with uh, bioenergy. So we used existing data sets to help us um, align our numbers with what is existing at the state level. So Kentucky is really not known for renewable energy production. According to the information that uh, we got from uh, Department of Energy, US Department of Energy, an agency called um, Energy Information Administration, which has um, a database of all energy statistics, Kentucky only has 0.6% uh, of its energy uh, being generated uh, from biomass. And uh, this is at the state level. So for consistency, given that we didn't have any um, information available for the study region uh, in Eastern Kentucky, we needed a baseline that we could use to simulate uh, a number of uh, policy scenarios. So we assume that the Eastern Kentucky uh, study region had about 0.6% of its total energy or electricity generated from biomass. So of course, uh, we wanted to have or estimate potential economic impacts if we went ahead to implement this project. And uh, of course, there are a lot of scenarios that we could come up with or we could model. However, we did not want to do this uh, facetly or without any basis, because if we did that, then it would not really generate any meaningful information relevant for us. So we considered two major scenarios. The first one was to look at if we could increase uh, electric power production uh, from its current level to 
somewhere close to the national level. So at the US national level, currently electricity, electricity production as a share of total electricity output is about 1.9%. So we started by looking at uh, increasing our electric power production from biomass, uh, look at three different levels. So we considered low level, which was basically to increase uh, the share of uh, electric production uh, contributed from biomass from six, 0.6% to 0.9%, which basically is a 50% increase. The medium level was to have a 100% increase from 0.6% to 1.2%. And the high level was to increase this to by 138%, which would give us 1.4% of electric production coming from uh, wood biomass. So somebody may, may be wondering right now, why 138, why not 120 or 140? So within these models, there, is, there are a lot of constraints that we are dealing with because we are supposed to take care of everything that is happening in the economy. And uh, it, there are a lot of constraints within this model that cannot allow us just to implement any, any of us at shocks. So we tried different levels and uh, we came up with this as a reasonable and of course also meaningful within the overall context of um, uh, CHP production and uh, bioenergy uh, production in the context of Kentucky and also in the context of the United States as a whole. The second scenario that we looked at, uh, which again, has some relevance. Um, we know that uh, from the previous um, uh, analysis that my colleagues have presented, we have so much biomass that can potentially be utilized to produce energy. The question is, why are we not producing uh, bioenergy? Why are we not generating bioenergy? We are generating most of our electricity from coal, even though we have a lot of wood biomass that can be used. So there are a lot of um, constraints that um, let us let this happen and will still continue to let this happen. So we hypothetically looked at what kind of economic incentive can we use to stimulate electricity production uh, from wood biomass? And one of the tools that are used in this kind of scenarios is tariffs. You are all aware of the trade war that is currently going on between US and China and uh, the Trump administration is implementing various tariffs on the goods that are imported from China. So tariffs is basically uh, a price. When there is increase in tariff, we are directly or indirectly increasing the price of that particular good that we are imposing tariffs on. So in economics, we have what we call substitute goods. So substitute goods is, for instance, uh, is a case whereby one can be used in place of the other. So um, I don't know whether this is the, the correct example to give, but uh, you can, if you don't have coffee, you can take tea, but there are those people who would not want to take tea. So if coffee is not there, I don't know what else they, they would drink, but it is something like that. So, we can produce our electricity from coal, or we can produce the same electricity from wood biomass. However, from economic principles, we would want 
to do what is cheaper to produce or what has higher returns. So there is this uh, demand and supply, which is also uh, guarded by uh, prices. So given all else being equal, uh, consumers would buy or would prefer electricity produced from either uh, biomass or from coal, and that is purely based on preference. However, if there is price differential, people would usually buy uh, a cheaper product if they get the same satisfaction or utility from either of them. So for us to stimulate um, electricity production from biomass, we introduced tariffs on non-renewable electricity production, which currently is charged at 9.5%. And of course, we know tariffs are not, um, the rate, tariff rates are really not like going at a higher rate. So we wanted to be modest. And I uh, just want to give you an example. A 5% increase, for instance, means that if we are buying a good at uh, a commodity at $100, it means the next, following the 5% increase, we are going to buy it at $105. And uh, if we increase it by 10%, we are going to buy it now 110 instead of a hundred dollars and uh, etc so this in reality are basically huge price increases that will directly um, tilt or shift the demand to a cheaper good if you go to a shop and you are looking at um, two uh, alternatives of something that you want to buy, and one is $120, and the other one is $100. Uh, from economic point of view, talking of a rational, rational behavior from a consumer, you would buy the one that is costing less. And of course, uh, some of you may be wondering, how comes um, people, there are people who want to buy more expensive things? But that is totally a different economic concept because it depends on the type of good that we are dealing with. So we are looking at electricity here as what we call in economic terms, a normal good. So if it is a luxury good, of course, the higher the price, the higher is the demand. So if uh, Covet is, if somebody wants to sell for you a Covet at uh, uh, $20,000, you'll think twice, and that is really not a real Covet but you will rush to buy a covert when somebody is selling for your covert at um, 80,000. You say, oh yeah, that is a real price and you want to go for that. So that is totally a different uh, uh, economic uh, behavior. So we are looking at those two scenarios um, of uh, policy shocks that we are uh, implementing in this model. So the first one, we are trying to increase electricity production from wood biomass. Two, we are trying also to incentivize a more demand for uh, electricity produced from wood biomass by making non-renewable electricity more expensive. So we implemented these two shocks um, simultaneously in our economic model. So we are now on the results and I'll um, take it back. I'll come later on to explain what are the, what, what, what are the implications of those shocks uh, that I've just talked about. So um, Kenton, um, you can go ahead and uh, explain the results uh, of uh, special analysis. Awesome, thank you, Thomas. So, um, kind of, you know, thinking back to um, where we were talking about our spatial analysis. These are um, some of the results from um, from that analysis. 
um, and let me just try to orient you to this figure. This is a map that um, displays the counties that were in our study region. Um, again, these are Eastern Kentucky counties that were selected um, because um, they're mostly rural and because of the forest industry that's, um, that's thriving in, in this region. Um, the blue dots of varying sizes are um, sawmills and the larger the dot, uh, the greater the amount of residual that's produced at the given sawmill. Um, <laughs> excuse me. The um, squares, the yellow and pink squares, are hospitals. These are all hospitals that were identified as um, potentially suitable candidates for establishing a CHP unit. And the yellow dot, or sorry, the yellow squares are um, hospitals at which um, it was deemed uh, potentially feasible to establish a 100 kilowatt um, CHP unit. And the uh, pink squares are where it was deemed potentially suitable, um, feasible to establish a two megawatt um, unit. And so again, um, these are um, hospitals um, that are close enough to residual production at sawmills um, that renders transportation of um, that residual material from the sawmill to the hospital uh, potentially economically feasible. And then moving along to the low-grade um, biomass or standing unmarketable timber. Um, again, this um, figure, this analysis was conducted with forced inventory analysis data um, and uh, basically reveals that there's a tremendous amount of uh, low-grade um, biomass or unmarketable timber in eastern Kentucky forests. Um, and, and I think that maybe the major takeaway from this figure is that um, in, in a scenario in which a CHP unit is, is built at a, at a hospital, for example, in this case, um, if uh, there were some kind of uh, problem with residual supply from sawmills, um, this figure suggests that there's, there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, material that would be potentially suitable just standing in the forest so that could be harvested and, and put to that use. So, and, and I just wanted to highlight the, um, what some of these, what some of the standing unmarketable timber might look like. Um, so these um, might be large trees that have some kind of damage. Um, that render them unmarketable for or unusable uh, for timber um, kinds of products. Um, but these could still be harvested and removed from the forest, um, releasing um, more valuable species or more valuable individuals uh, to grow and, and flourish and then be harvested later for timber. Um, but the damaged or unmarketable material can be removed and, and put to a use such as uh, bioenergy production. Um, real quick, we wanted to demonstrate um, the web tool that was produced um, as part of this uh, project. Um, and, and we want to um, credit Jordan and Diraj who produced this, um, this great tool. Um, and basically this tool um, synthesizes and displays the, the data from the spatial analysis that was um, conducted as part of this project, and I just want to really quickly um, orient you to it, and you can um, take you know take a look at it and, and manipulate it um, as you like later. Um, so this is kind of a lot on the on the um, on the map right now, um, but again, this is our map of our study region and our um, counties here. Um, you can select which um, kinds of uh, which indicators you want to be displayed on the map. Um, in this case, I'm just going to um, unselect the police and fire. Um, and this will give us um, sawmills, which are green, um, and then hospitals. Um, and so in this case, um, the orange um, indicators are hospitals that were deemed to be feasible um, for establishment of a 100 kilowatt. Um, CHP unit and the pink indicators are the locations that were uh, considered potentially suitable for a two megawatt um, location. And so just as an example, you can click on an indicator and access information about um, the productivity, in this case of a, of a sawmill, the productivity of the sawmill, the amount of residuals that are being produced, 
um, are reported on an annual basis. And for the hospitals, you can access information about how many beds are in the hospital, the estimated square footage, and the estimated energy use. Um, and then also one other thing that I wanted to highlight is the uh, heat maps um, that Jordan and Diraj produced. Um, and these basically give you the opportunity to um, select a point on the map and then get information about the nearest critical infrastructure point to the point that you selected. Um, and it tells you how far the travel distance would be. Um, and again, this uses the Google, um, Google Maps um, dis travel distance estimation. And then you can also um, manipulate how the data are displayed, um, basically which, um, what kinds of uh, criteria you want to use um, as far as distance goes. So over on these indicators, you can um, basically tell it to only display um, information about uh, points that are within a certain kind of parameter, certain, certain kind of distance away um, from a critical infrastructure point. Um, so in this case, um, I think we've successfully uh, limited it to only points that are uh, 10 miles um, away. And so the points that are greater than 10 miles will be displayed in blue and the points that are under 10 miles will be displayed in the other colors. So this is a tool that can give you the opportunity to go into any kind of point, um, any pixel that you select or any point on the map that you select and get some information about how um, far away um, the transportation distance would be uh, to uh, critical infrastructure, nearest critical infrastructure location. Let me go back to this. Um, and then back to Dr. Oshida to talk about the economic impacts. Oh, okay, thank you. So, as you remember uh, from my uh, previous uh, talk, I talked about um, us simulating two scenarios. So, in this table, uh, we have some results of potential economic impacts. So these are potential economic impacts. What that means is um, if we were to go ahead and do what we propose to do. So uh, these are the potential economic impact as produced from our analytical tool. Other different tools would give us different results. And I want to emphasize this because many people usually don't uh, understand the what economic uh, impact numbers really mean. Some people want to take them and run away with them. Some people take them to be really um, casting mortar and stone. Some people take them to be arbitrary, depending on your understanding of uh, what these are and how they're generated and from which uh, perspective you are coming from. So I want just to um, get out like a bit that these are potential economic impacts based on our analysis, based on our analytical tool, and also based on the assumptions that we had in the model. If we would go ahead and change all those, this table would have different numbers. So I want you to take this with the, uh, the necessary question that I should go with that. So on this table, we have uh, what we call household annual income category. So we wanted to know what is the net household income uh, resulting from increasing uh, electricity production from bio wood biomass. At the same time, implementing um, increased tariffs on non-renewable electricity. So, I wanted to look at this, how it is affecting households, but not just all households aggregated. We categorize the households based on income levels. So we have three household income levels. Low, those who are earning up to 40,000 per year. Medium, between 40 to 100,000 per year. High, 
those who are earning more than 100,000 per year. Then the second column is on the number of households, meaning how many households fall within that income category. So the first one, the low income group, we have 189,000 households, which constitute 56% of the total households in the study region. Uh, medium households, 114,000, which represent 34% of the total households under region of study. Households with under high income category are only 35,000 or 10% of the total number of households. So the under model scenarios, we have low, medium, high, if you remember what I talked about. So under low is when we are increasing our uh, bioenergy production by 50%. At the same time, we are implementing 5% tariffs on non-renewable uh, energy. And the medium one is uh, increasing our bioenergy share um, uh, or production by 100% and increasing our tariffs on non-renewable energy, uh, non energy by 10%. Uh, uh, and then the high is increasing our bioenergy production by 138% and our non, um, renewable energy tariff uh, rate by 20%. So the economic, potential economic impacts there we have are in dollars. So under low income category, they are going to have a net household income of $50,000. This is not per individual. This is among all the households. And that is only a 0.005% increase in their household income. And we can read the table in a similar manner across the board. What I also want you to see, which is apparent, is that even though majority of the households are under low income category, those who are earning less than $40,000 per year, they are not actually the greatest beneficiaries of this, um, um, these changes. You see that even though a high income category is only 10%, um, they are, proportionately earning, benefiting much higher than the lower income category. And this raises all those issues that we, we talk about every day in economic policy uh, equity. Who benefits, who pays, and by how much? I'll take you to the next uh, table here, which looks at uh, GDP. I didn't want to present this table, but I know most people are interested in it. GDP as it is, actually is not a welfare measure from economic, economically, uh, from economic point of view. GDP is just what is the total value of all the goods and services that we produce in an economy. It really does not measure how we are doing as individual citizens. Right now, everybody in the U.S. is talking of GDP, how our GDP is doing very well, how the economy is doing very well. However, if you are not doing well as an individual, if your house rent or your, 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 the rent you pay or your electricity bill is increasing at a higher rate than your income, it doesn't matter how well GDP is doing. So I'm presenting this basically um, for the purposes of those people who are interested in this. And I know many people are, uh, but I'm also giving you that caution that GDP really is just, what is the total value of all the goods and services that we produce as economy, as a region, as a state, or as a country? And it may not really have any direct relationship between how we as individual consumers are doing. So again, under the same scenarios that we looked at, you can see 
I presented, uh, first of all, I presented uh, three different types of G GDP. Um, again, this uh, may require more time for me to explain what is the difference between these types of GDP. So the first one is GDP at factor cost. So this is the normal GDP that we usually use, that we usually uh, look at or know. Then uh, we have GDP at market prices. So GDP at factor cost is basically what is the cost of labor and uh, capital and uh, any other thing that we use in the production process. So GDP at market prices, again, what we call regional GDP or what we ritual use, takes care of how the prices are changing. The, the wage rates and the price of uh, renting capital. Then the third one is what we call GDP value added for the economy. So we are including the wage and capital bills in addition to indirect business taxes. So if somebody were to be very selective and wanted you to see how this project would be so great, you would basically eliminate the first three, the first two are only present at the bottom one. On the other hand, if somebody wanted to, to diminish the impact of, uh, of, of, of what we are trying to do, they would select the one with the, with the lowest uh, GDP and they may not actually uh, let you know or see the others. So again, I would want you to uh, interpret this uh, bearing in mind a lot of things that are, go are taking place within the the economy or within the model that generated these numbers. Um, this table to me is the most important of all the results that we generated. We call it um, social welfare. Social welfare impact. This was measured as what we call in economics equivalent variation. And I want to take a few minutes to explain what it is so that it is um, clearer to those people who don't, under, uh, don't have an economic uh, background. So a welfare is how you are doing as a consumer, how you are doing. And uh, again, I'll go back to what I talked about earlier on. You may have increase in salary. If today your employer increases your salary by 10%, Assuming you are earning $50,000 in a year, and your employer says, uh, we are very gracious, we have uh, awarded you 10% uh, salary increment, which means your annual salary is going to be uh, 55,000 um, the, following, the following year. However, that, price, the, the, that increase in income must take into consideration the increase in the cost of living. And here is what I mean. Assuming when you are earning 50,000 before the price, before the salary increase, your total annual budget of all you needed to, to, to live was 40,000, which means you had 10,000 available for savings. Now that you, your company has increased your salary annual income to 55,000, there are other things that are also happening in the economy, meaning prices are also changing. And if prices have increased such that, instead of you needing 40,000 to meet your basic needs and saving the rest, now you need 52,000 to meet your basic needs. What is left for your savings now, instead of 10,000, is only 3,000. So in real sense, you are worse off today with that salary increment together with the price increment than you were last year. So if you are given a choice as a consumer, would you remain in the previous year's level of earning and level of expenditure or would you want to take the uh, salary increment, that of course will go with increase in price. Um, a rational person will say, I would want to retain my old 
uh, salary and my old level of expenditure. And that is what this is measuring. So it means it is looking at how much income change do you have? And taking care of how much changes in prices have taken place. So what it means in this case, the households, as we have described them under the three income categories, are actually better off through implementation of uh, the scenarios that we have looked at compared to if these were not implemented. So they are better off. They, they have additional money in their pockets if we implement this. So we have scenarios whereby, even though there is increase in income, the equivalent increase in prices would make you worse off than without. So welfare impacts to me are the most important um, um, uh, microeconomic indicators of how well a country is doing. And it should be actually what we are looking at when we are looking at what are the potential economic impacts. We may have more jobs generated, but the prices that, are, that, that accompany the jobs increase are far much greater than the new um, um, wage increases that we experience. So I would leave you with that. And uh, again, also uh, remember that we would have different numbers if we were to change other parameters uh, within our economic model. What do we have left? Um, thanks, Thomas. And real quick, I just wanted to, um, we're running out of time, and I did want us to have a, a few minutes for questions. So um, let me real quickly kind of highlight some of our ideas for future additional research. Um, this uh, project identified, um, I preliminary or candidate sites um, that might be economically feasible for establishing a, a wood-fired um, combined heat and power unit. Um, but uh, I think it would be really informative um, to go back and do a, a more intense um, and detailed economic analysis at each of these candidate sites um, and include all of the additional possible costs and other kinds of, um, other kinds of scenarios um, that are relevant in this, in this particular um, in this particular um, industry. So for example, the costs to um, actually build the CHP unit um, and estimated payoff periods for that, costs to maintain the, the unit um, and, and how that kind of um, would adjust the p possible feasibility of acquiring feedstock material. Um, also possible cost share, subsidy and tax break options um, under different kinds of policy scenarios. Um, and then a, a, an, an additional interesting um, avenue for follow-up research would be um, investigating, maybe not from a bioenergy perspective, but from other kinds of um, industrial applications of wood waste, um, what kinds of opportunities there might be for establishing those kinds of facilities at these, at these spots or close to these spots. Um, so we do want to um, gratefully acknowledge our funders for this project. Our project was funded by the Kentucky Energy and Environment Cabinet State Wood Energy Team, um, and we're really grateful for their support. Um, and hopefully we have um, a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has questions, um, you can type them into the chat function. Um, we're going to hopefully be able to address some of those. So we can't hear them. <coughs> I believe their microphones are muted, but yeah. they have some questions. They can yeah. chat here in the text box yeah. inside. Okay. So we'll take just a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. So do you know how many people are like tuning in? Billy and Renee do. Hmm? Billy and Renee do. Oh, they know. I don't know if somebody is typing in. Yeah, 
and the chat bot is in the bottom right hand corner of our screen. I believe it should be that way in everyone else's as well. We're just points, point where it is. Did you consider the resource <laughs> outside on, of on the, the screen, state? On the screen. With the map. See, oh, yes. Here's a question. Be able to see my map. So there's a question. Did you consider a resource outside of the state boundary? That's a good question. Um, to my knowledge, for the spatial analysis, we did not. Um, we restricted it to just those counties. So we didn't even consider resources that were in Kentucky for the spatial analysis in Kentucky, but just not in those counties. We were only um, considering those counties. So that would be a, an important, that could be an important follow up. Again, for each candidate site that was identified, we could um, kind of re relax those um, spatial boundaries and, and, and really investigate everything. That's a good question. Other questions? They're all happy. <laughs> Everybody's happy. We'll wait just another couple minutes in case anybody has any other questions. But um, but we do recognize that we are over time. And so we just want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. And thanks for your interest. Um, and please. Um, and please, you know, feel free to be in contact. Our information is available on um, the UK uh, Forestry Extension webpage and, and other and other sites. So please do feel free to contact with follow-up questions if you have any. Okay. Somebody. Can you scroll down on this one? All right, thank you everyone. As Kenton mentioned, if you have any follow-up questions, please reach us through Forestry Extension. Thank you, have a great day.